and get started. Um, and just so you guys know, this is being live streamed as well. So there's people at home watching and then the videos will be available to you to watch afterwards. So don't feel like you have to take all your notes. Um, uh, a reminder to just silence your phones if you would please. Um, and then also we have um, vendors in the um, um, lobby area, or not lobby area, the, the area right outside here underneath the escalators. Um, and one of our new vendors is Angelman University, who, um, we, which was a platform that was just launched earlier this week, um, uh, founded by Siobhan Sargent, our very own Siobhan Sargent. Um, and we're really excited about the launch of this amazing, amazing resource for parents, for educators, for all the support people in, in your child's life. Um, this is where you can go to to uh, get courses and information um, that are very difficult to find for your kids with, with Angelman syndrome. So this is a place where, um, you know, if I can surmise for, for Siobhan, uh, it, it started out of the need of being able to go to one place where we can find information about our kids um, in terms of their behaviors, their strengths, um, communication. Um, so please check it out. It's very, very cool and uh, it's very exciting that, that it's been launched. So kudos to Siobhan for her, uh, her amazing, amazing hard work on that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the afternoon's panel. Um, it's a change from what we have in our program. Uh, so Mary Louise is going to be speaking on What We Have Learned Works, the 2018 edition. Without further ado. Thank you very much. And I'm very excited about Angelman Academy. Congratulations to Siobhan. Um, so Erin and I, Erin Sheldon and I first presented here uh, in 2012, six years ago. So we did our presentation, which has been on YouTube, and we get lots of questions about that presentation. Um, one of the questions that always comes up is, why don't you talk about apps during that talk? And it's like, because apps didn't exist. Communication apps didn't exist then. <laughs> um, or if they did, there was maybe one, and we weren't using it. Um, so what I want to talk about now is what we've learned in that six years. And I'm sure there'll be another edition in a couple of years of what we've learned from now. Um, we have learned that a lot of families have a lot of guilt. We have learned that many professionals have a lot of guilt. Um, so I just wanna talk about this guilt because this comes up in all of our support groups on Facebook, in emails that we receive um, and these are the most common threads that we talk about. Um, there's the guilt and the comment, I should have known all this communication stuff. And to that we say, no, you shouldn't have. Your child didn't come with a manual. You have to tell yourself it's perfectly a-okay that you didn't know about POD or Proloquo to go or Aided Language Input. You'd actually be kind of weird if you did. Um, but you've landed in this land of communicate, complex communication needs and onward and upward from here. And you need to repeat after me when you feel this guilt, we do the best with what we can um, and we do the best we can with what we know. The next guilt is, um, oh, I should have done this sooner. And to that guilt we say, no, you need to trust in the timing. For many families, especially in the early days, in puberty, there's a focus on day-to-day -day survival, and that's life, and it's okay. If you're ready now, then the Angelman communication community are here for you. Um, if you don't feel ready yet, then you can just stalk us on Facebook and YouTube, and that's fine too. Um, but remember, you may never feel ready. And if we wait for the absolutely perfect time, it might actually never happen. So sometimes we have to take a leap of faith and just start. Um, but it's actually okay if you also tell yourself, actually, mm, life's a bucket of poo right now and I'm juggling a bazillion plates in the air and if I try anything new, we're gonna have a bazillion smash plates in a pile of poo and I can't handle that. So you just take another breath and think about it, about it again tomorrow. We have a lot of guilt amongst our families um, who say, I should have trusted the therapist. 
I should have trusted the educator. I should have trusted the professional. Families that were given poor advice, advice that um, is decades old in terms of the evidence base. Um, and to that we say, yes, you should have been able to trust the expert. You landed in this new place and the expert guide was meant to guide you well. You were right to be expect to be shown the best practice. You were right to trust. But if the speech therapist or the educator or the doctor didn't guide you well, that's not your fault and you need to shake that guilt off. Something must have happened in your mind, in your gut instincts, in your experience to make you think there must be a better way, there must be another way. So you trusted your gut, you trusted yourself. So there's no guilt to be had over that. You explored up the options and you landed here. We need to remember that not all speech therapists, not all educators, not all professionals are experts with alternative and augmentative communication. Not all specialise it, not all receive enough training in it. There are best practices in AAC that all therapists should be aware of, but this field is a rel relatively new thing. And what the Angelman community do is, is doing in the communication revolution is actually leading the world. Also know that many speech and language pathologists feel a lot of guilt about not knowing what to do too. Um, so many of our families say, oh my goodness, I have so much to do, so much to catch up on, so much to learn. Yeah, it is a steep learning curve, but you don't need to know, nor are you expected to know, absolutely everything about AAC, aided language input, symbols, modelling, technology by the end of this weekend. Just tell yourself, baby steps. And remember, there will no, be no exam at the end of this presentation. There'll be coffee and food. And if you're at home watching this on YouTube, you can get yourself coffee and food and go back to the couch and think about it again another day. Many, many of our families who have um, teens and adults with Angelman say, I'm too late. I missed that window. I missed that communication window. We say, no, the window never closes fully. Sometimes it gets a bit jammed and we have to recruit a team to try and coax it open wider, but it never closes super tight, never. A bit of elbow grease and a glass of wine always helps. So the bottom line, dear families, is that the day your child was born, you got injected with a dose of grade A parent guilt. Know that the communication and literacy journey that you and your child are on will have hills, valleys, ebbs, flows, forks in the road, potholes, beauty, laughter and tears. Please also remember that this AAC literacy and Angelman revolution is still in its infancy. There is so much we are learning. We all have guilt about not doing enough, not being enough, and sometimes we just have to squash that guilt down into our gumboot and just keep hobbling on. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned that Angelman syndrome is a spectrum, that each, in, each child, each adult with Angelman is an individual, but the children with Angelman share certain characteristics. And we talked about these this morning and I'm gonna go through them again in case there are people that weren't watching this morning. The characteristics of children with Angelman is that they're curious, they're tenacious, determined, persistent, absolutely fantastic problem solvers, hands-on learners, enthusiastic, and they're the boredom barometers in your classroom. Many professionals use the term low functioning and high functioning, or he's a low functioning person with Angelman, or he's very high functioning. They equate children with mosaic, children with ICD, children with UPD as high functioning, children with deletion positive Angelman as low functioning. We need to remember we are only as high functioning as our supports enable us to be. Every single one of us, if we were dropped into Syria today, would be incredibly low functioning. We would be frightened, not understand the language, not know what to do, not have a team to support us. If we were prepped for it, if we had a squad with us and we, we knew some language, we knew some signs, we knew where we were going, we knew what was going to happen, we had people supporting us, we would look pretty high functioning. 
So our functioning level is all about the supports that we need. And it is up to the adults in the classroom, the adults in the daycare, the adults in the situation to problem solve the supports that the student needs. It is not their job to blame the child as supposedly low functioning. Everyone can learn and every person can contribute to our community and our world. So when we look at the spectrum of severity in Angelman, instead of using terms like low functioning and high functioning, let's use terms like more affected or less affected. So really be clear on what issues that child has. His motor skills are severely affected by Angelman. His sensory processing is severely affected. His expressive language is severely affected. His motor skills are mildly affected. And this helps us describe the child and what supports, and we then know what supports we need to put into place to, in order to support this child to develop. So we ran through these this morning and I'll run through them again for people who are watching. When we look about the, at the key issues in Angelman, we're looking at motor planning issues. Apraxia and dyspraxia, the disconnect between what I want to do and getting my body to do it motor planning issues in terms of communication, using my voice, using speech, difficulties with hand-eye coordination, knowing where my body is in space, knowing depth perception. We've got lots of um, children with Angelman who will, when they come to a line on the floor, will tap it with their foot because they're not sure if it's just a line or maybe it's a curb and it's a drop. So depth perception is an issue for many children with Angelman. The ability to isolate your body parts, to be able to move one hand without the other hand coming along. The balance disorder that the children have, the way they're so strategic in the way they um, stabilise their core with their arms up. Everything the children do is, is strategic. The tremors that a lot of our teenagers have all impact um, on their access to communication. This is a slide that Finn's mum put um, up on Facebook and we were at school one day and Finn's teacher, I had asked him to sort pens from something else and Finn had one tub of pens here and a tub of, oh, pretend it was um, crayons here, and his teacher had asked him to sort. So Finn was picking up a pen and putting it in and he would get stuck in the motor loop of put that one in, put that one in, put that in, pick up a crayon and it would go in the pen. He, you could see him looking that it wasn't going in the right thing, but his body was stuck in a motor loop of they're just all going there. And his teacher said, oh, he doesn't know how to sort. So we went home and Tina put a bucket over that side of the room and a box over that side of the room. And she mixed up all the buttons and the coins on the floor in the middle and he had to sort them out. And giving him the time to pick something up and run to one direction and put it in and check it, gave him the chance to um, sort what he needed to sort because he would get to it and either divert that way and coming back gave him a chance to reboot his motor loop. So we need to be careful about what tasks we are asking the children to do to judge their cognition when the motor planning issues are getting involved. The happy demeanour of so many people with Angelman impacts on their learning and their communication. A lot of children have the laughing reflex. They get a fright and a laugh comes out. They're anxious, a laugh comes out. Some children have this passivity of, I'm gonna go with the flow. Laughing can interfere with communication. Some children get really agitated, really escalated, and they're laughing, laughing, laughing. People think that children are enjoying things. And we know that there's a happy laugh, a scared laugh, a frightened laugh, a naughty laugh, an anxious laugh. Not everyone can tell those laughs apart. So the children are judged as being happy all the time. Laughing is not a way of saying yes. And we talk about this all the time. Laughing can interfere with people's um, perceptions of a child's intellect. Because if I say, oh, your grandma died, 
did your grandma die? And the only way you've taught me to say yes is for me to laugh, and I laugh in answer to that, then you're now questioning, do I understand what death means and that this is actually sad? Because now I'm laughing. So we need to be really careful that laughing, smiling is not a way of saying yes. Oh, I can see you laughing. I can see you're smiling. You're saying, yes, Mary Louise, I do that one. Do want that one. I'm nodding my head, yes. We teach them other ways of saying yes. Many of our children and adults with Angelman will and families will be disbelieved when they go to the emergency room and say, my child, I think she's got a broken bone. And you see this child walking up and down the hospital corridor, laughing their heads off. So what we need to be very careful of is that if your child has any type of pain signature, what is it that made you think that something's not right? Then we need that pain signature recorded, written down, so you can go into the hospital and say, this is her normal presentation, this is her pain signature, I need you to take this seriously. The sensory processing issues in Angelman, we've learned a lot about this in the last six years. Many of the children have um, proprioceptive needs. They need to be snuggled tight. They need compression garments. There's a lot of mouthing, a lot of teething, really needing strong input into the jaw. Um, many of the children need a lot of oral sensory input. We see older children still needing um, pacifiers. And if that's what they need in order to calm their body and think, then that's what they need. So yes, we can try and look at replacing those behaviours with the use of chewy tubes, with the use of intense or, um, intensive oral sensory supports, but understand that if your child's five, seven and still using a pacifier, that's the strategy at the moment. If that's what helps them, that's what helps them. Um, a lot of children will rock flap, um, doing vestibular base, they're trying to find out where their body is in space. Jumping, bouncing, flapping, all these areas, trying to find out where I am and what my body's doing. So a lot of um, our children are receiving really good quality uh, sensory support and sensory strategies from occupational therapists. And all children should have a sensory profile done if we consider, if we are thinking anything um, that, that they are presenting with could be sensory processing issues. There are a small number of children with Angelman who have been diagnosed with comorbid autism. Now, I do understand in some places in the world, in order to get good funding, it helps to have an autism diagnosis. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the children that present not in the typical happy Angelman style, but they present as if they have autism. In most of these children, we have found um, that they have significant auditory processing difficulties. They're not understanding speech like the major component of kids with Angelman do. They're not processing auditory input the same as other children with Angelman. So they may have autism, they may have auditory processing issues. And when we look at um, children with auditory processing issues who don't seem to understand speech, it can help to do some language sampling about the words they are understanding or we think they understand um, and the words that um, they're not. If they're having a lot of struggles around transitions, we had one family who every time they got up to leave somewhere, the child would have a complete and utter meltdown. And so we did a language sample with the family of every time they said we're going or they meant they tried to communicate the intent of we are, excuse me, we are going, what did they actually say? So this one family said words like, come on, let's go, time to get out of here, oh, he's going to lose it, I've had enough, we need to leave, he's getting tired, we're running late. And all of those phrases signified to everyone else in the family that it was time to go. But nothing told this child that it was time to go. He was magically meant to interpret this phrase as, let's go, we're going. 
So these enormous meltdowns that were happening, he wasn't processing this speech, he wasn't understanding this speech. When we shifted it to using a communication system and simply modelling go, it's time to go, pointing to go, using the voice output on the system, go. That meant everybody was saying the same thing. The computer voice, the iPad voice, always said go the exact same way. There was no different inflection, there was no different accent. So for students with auditory processing issues, the students that are often called low functioning, we don't need to give them less language, we need to give them more language because they need a visual referent for everything that we're saying. Um, one family had a similar issue and they were using speak for yourself and the child um, could target uh, the cells on speak for yourself, but the family found it too overwhelming to have all the cells open. So they simply masked them and they would say, it's time to go. Oh, it's time for you to go. I'm going now. And suddenly this child starts to connect. When we say go, everyone up and moves. So we can start to build some trust into the transitions, help them learn what that spoken word go means. In the last six years, we've learned an enormous amount about uh, the vision issues in students with Angelman. And one thing that has been really defining in our understanding of how people with Angelman use their vision is using Toby Dynavox's Gaze Viewer program. So Gaze Viewer is an assessment tool you, um, where you use eye gaze cameras on a computer or an eye gaze system from Toby Dynavox and the software records where the person is looking. So I can see a hot spot of where that person is looking. And so we're looking at where, what are they actually attending to? When they're watching the video of mum and dad at the pool, where are they looking? The hotspot will tell me they're looking at the pool. They're looking at mum and dad's faces. So I know what I need to model in those situations because I'm looking at what they're interested in. We can also use this for literacy assessments and we can do a beautiful concepts of print assessment because I can bring a book, um, the page from a book up on the computer and I know exactly where that child is looking because there's a little mouse um, dot indicating where that student is looking. And I can say to them, oh, I wonder where I should start reading. And if they look at the picture, then I know that's the level they're at. If they're looking up at the text, I know they've got some concept of word. They know what text is for. So this um, gaze viewer has been incredible in the way that we've learnt what children with Angelman are looking at, how they're using their vision. And even for our children with cortical vision impairment, we have students using Toby, um, Toby Dynavox eye gaze with programs like Look to Learn to teach them to use their vision. Um, children with Angelman who have had strabismus. We talked about this this morning and I'll raise it again because we've really noticed this in the last couple of years. Um, children with Angelman, if you've had a squint and your eye is pointing out one way, your brain has only been receiving input from one eye, this eye. So it's not listening to this eye anymore. Now when you have surgery and that eye is flicked back, suddenly the brain has to start processing that again. In children where the squint has been corrected cosmetically, sometimes the brain still doesn't listen to that eye. So those children aren't seeing in binocular vision, they're seeing in one, uh, one eye vision, monocular vision. So their eye is here. So the way they use their vision, their midline is no longer here, their midline is in the middle of this eye. So they will be turning and using that vision in interesting ways. And you need to be wary of this if you're a teacher and you're asking, you're holding a book session, you're asking students to look, because it may look like the child is looking over there, but actually they're looking at you. We have um, lots of children with cortical vision impairment and Angelman syndrome who are on this cortical vision impairment range at phase two. Um, some of our young babies and toddlers are at phase one, but most of our three to four to five year olds and up stay at phase two. Um, 
and they have great difficulty coordinating auditory input, listening, and visual input, looking. So these children will look at you, and when you start talking, they'll turn away and they'll listen. And when you stop talking, they'll turn back to you to look. So again, if you're a teacher, an early intervention worker, and you're reading a story, they'll be looking and listening separately. So we need to decide if that's what the student's doing. You need to decide if your student is, you want your student to look at you or you want your student to listen. Because it might be, it may be, may be at that time, then they need to look away in order to listen to the instruction. So understanding that everything the child does is strategic means that we look at these behaviours as strategic behaviours that fit with the, pro the profile of Angelman, the profile of uh, different uh, cortical vision impairment or cerebral visual impairment. But even if you have a severe cortical vision impairment at phase one, phase two, communication still trumps everything. You still have the right to have a comprehensive communication system. So for our students who, have, who are severely affected motor-wise, who may use wheelchairs, who may have a significant vision impairment, there is still an AAC system out there for them. If they can't reach and touch, if they can't see symbols, if they can't process that visual information, there is an AAC system out there for them. And we're having a lot of success with partner-assisted scanning and POD for those students. Seizures and sleep uh, have a huge effect on our students with Angelman. The different seizure types, the various medications, non-convulsive status, and the impact that seizures have on sleep all affect how the child acts the next day. Sleep has an enormous impact on learning, an impact on seizures, and an impact on the family. And we need our families that we're supporting to know that if they've got a child, a teenager, an adult with Angelman, and their child is having significant seizure issues, significant lack of sleep, if all they are doing to support communication is trying to get seizures under control and trying to put in a solid sleep routine, then they are doing the best they can to support communication development in their child. A lot of people say that children with Angelman are easily distracted. Well, actually, they notice everything. We need to support our children to build filters. And again, we talked about it this morning that when the lawnmower's outside, the attention is drawn out to the lawnmower rather than to be in here. So we need to name that and help the child build a filter. Yes, that's the lawnmower outside. We don't need to worry about that. Um, yes, that's the hoover going on. Don't need to worry about that. We're doing this now. We help them by acknowledge, uh, acknowledging what it is, helping them build the filter and move on. Um, the attention span, the distractibility, the noticing everything, the children with Angelman are processing absolutely everything. They're processing the visual feedback in the room. They're listening to everything. They're touching everything and getting that sensory input. So there are so many distractions. Sometimes we need to set the children up for success in a low stimulus area so that they can concentrate. Um, we have a number of people with Angelman who have significant challenging behaviours. And most of these uh, children and adults with Angelman do not yet use symbolic communication. Um, so we need to ensure that we give access to every single person, access to robust communication, comprehensive communication tools. That means they can complain, that they can boss people around, that they can be in charge because anxiety and anxiety related behaviours, challenging behaviours, self-injurious behaviours need to be talked about, need to be acknowledged. We need lots of social stories, we need lots of visual timetables, all those self-reg supports support our children. But the biggest thing is having a robust communication system where you can talk about your emotions, you can talk about what's wrong, you can say, look at me, look at me, look at me without chucking a shoe at someone's head. You get that attention. 
we have to make sure that this is control language for the child, that the child's AAC system is not just another way that they are bossed around. This must be a powerful thing for them, not for us. So challenging behaviour, it needs to be power words. We need to learn to respect boundaries. We support self-regulation by teaching words like safe hands, control your hands, not don't hit, don't touch, but control your hands, safe hands. I like how you've got safe hands. Oh, you're sitting next to grandma, you've got safe hands. Well done, I like your safe hands. We use social stories, video modelling and video self-modelling. And we complete a functional behaviour analysis. What are they communicating? Are they communicating, go away, look at me? Are they communicating swear words? Many of our adults are, and they need those swear words on their system. They have a right to those words on their system if that, what, if that is a word that their family uses. If it's not a word their family uses, they have a right to say it and then be told off. Thank you. Um, I just want to read something that Desiree wrote. She wrote, last year, Jazz always wanted to be in her room by herself. I would lock her out of her room so that she was forced to socialise, but she'd yell to go back in. She just seemed so depressed to me and it really broke my heart. At school, she was spitting nonstop and was even doing it constantly at home. So the school did a behaviour plan. And around that same time, I bought the pod app and gave ABA a shot. The ABA didn't last long as it was just too much for me and Jazz and I kept moving forward with the pod. Today I, I talked to Jasmine's old teacher and she asked how I was doing and I started crying because I realised just how much has changed in so little time. Now she's become my stalker. She follows me everywhere and has her talker and her iPad and she's following me around. She yells at me all day long with her talker to pay attention to what she has to say and she doesn't go to her room until we tell her it's bedtime. She will still occasionally grab at her younger sister, but only when she takes the iPad away. I just wanted to share an update and say thank you to you all. I'm very excited to see where the next year takes us. And we have these stories over and over again of children who were denied access to comprehensive AAC, who have significant challenging behaviours, whose families' lives are in turmoil, whose children are not happy. This myth that all children with Angelman are happy, it's, it's just a myth. Many of our young adults with Angelman are miserable, are anxious, and they need language. They need power language for themselves to have some choice and some control in their life. So when we think about children with Angelman, they have a strong desire to communicate. Most of our children with Angelman do not need to learn the intent to communicate. They, they have that, they are born with that. They will gaze at you and will you to read their brain. They will drive that eye contact into you. They will drag you to places. They will give you things. They will point to things. They will reach for things. They're showing you. They're communicating with every fiber of their being. They have that intent. Receptive language is typically um, better than expressive language. But again, we have some children who don't have strong receptive language. These children need a robust AAC system because they need us to present their language visually. They're not understanding it through speech, through listening to it, so we need to present it visually. So again, we need lots and lots of words because we have lots and lots to say. So children with Angelman require an alternative to spoken language from birth, from diagnosis. And that should be one of the first things that our paediatricians, our geneticists understand, is that children with Angelman have so much to say and they need a language from day dot. Aided language input is a necessity. It is our role, the role of the adults, the role of the people who do not have Angelman, to model that symbolic language as much as possible. When we look at what families wish they knew back when they first started AAC, we've got some really interesting things. What I wish now, what I know now that I wish I'd known then, that Cyrille would go through ups and downs in her expressive use of pod, and that really is okay. Even through the periods of time where her, her expressive use is very little, they're hard and discouraging, and I used to stress out about it. 
I have to remember to take this time to up my modelling and keep providing opportunities for her to communicate without the expectation that she will use it. Every time this has happened, and I know it will happen again, Cyril comes back using even more language than before. I remember when I first read that this was happening to someone further along the journey than me and it made me realise it's okay and that I didn't need to stress out about it so much. Tracy says, don't get cocky, kid. Modelling is not about showing off your skills and knowledge of a system. It's about saying the most relevant thing that is tangible to your child and keeping it short to hold their interest. And just start. There's no procrastination about becoming an expert. Our children are very forgiving of our mistakes. It teaches them that mistakes are okay. It is good for their self-confidence. Don't compromise their autonomy. Add words to the lists, add words to the talker. Give them the swear words. Reprimand them when they use it. Tina says, another big one is not to repeat, but rather to add what the child says. For example, if Finn grabs some cheese, not using the pod, but the actual cheese, don't just model, I want cheese in the pod, as that's disrespecting his other more efficient modes of communication. Instead, just use the pod to model, oh, I like this, yummy cheese. Uh, Leia's dad, Gordon, says, use it, it will work. Um, Corey said, while I knew I had permission to stick with quick chat, so that's quick words like more, finish, help, and simpler sentences, I think I felt like I was copping out by not being more elaborate in how I used the pod book early on. It took me a long time to really believe and internalise that using key words to just model at Lily Grace's level was not just okay, but it was the right thing to do. The same thing for making mistakes. It took me a while to not just feel okay about making mistakes, but to really get how important it was to make them and model how to fix it, how to repair, how to move on from them. Excuse me. Lily Grace also has taught me how important it is to keep up with modeling and for others to use her pod to talk. When her use goes down, it usually relates to a drop in others using her pod to talk. I really believe that we're sending her a message about how valued and respected her language is by how often we use it and how we use it and who is and isn't using it. Her patience with me is truly amazing. Keisha says, my number one hindsight advice is to understand that when your child walks away from your modelling, it does not necessarily mean they are disinterested like your gut tells you. I also wish I had fully understood how much time Riley needed to reflect on topics. Topics I had to learn this as we went along. And Jennifer says, building confidence, confidence with one or two pod branch starters at a time. So that's what we talked about this morning, where you choose that one thing like commenting, and you're going to work on that for a couple of weeks. So you get familiar with the language. Then you work on complaining, saying it's yucky, it's gross, it hurts. Then you work on something else, asking questions. So everyone's getting familiar with it and your child's getting a lot of exposure to different types of communication. And this is our darling photo of all our messy pod books and um, apps. So when we think about what we want for our students and children with Angelman, the long-term destination, that goal of communication autonomy, being able to say what I want to say to whoever I want to talk to, whenever I want to say it, and however I want to say it. So if we think about the goal of our children being um, 21 years old, 42 years old, being at a restaurant with their friends, with their support worker, with their cousin, with their whoever, they're at the table. They want to drink. I want them to be able to pick up a cup, and show the waitress, this is what I want. I want them to be able to use the object. If the cup isn't there, I want them to have, be able to see a picture of a uh, photograph of a drink in the menu and point to that and say, that's what I want. If there's no menu with a photograph, if there's no cup on the table, then they can use their talker to say, I want to drink. Now, when the waitress says, what do you want to drink? I want our children with Angelman to have, at the very least, some initial, initial letter queuing and sound alphabet awareness that they can go to their alphabet and type the letter C. And the waitress can then say, oh, coffee, Coke? Yes, oh, Coke's the one you want. 
So when we think about that multimodal communication, that total communication, we are embracing gestures, signs, the use of objects. Everything is valued. We have learned that AAC and Angelman syndrome, Pex alone is not enough. Our children with Angelman have communication initiation for the most part. If they don't have communication intention, communicative intent, it is most likely they have severe receptive language disorders. They might have uh, cortical vision impairment. There is something that is impeding this and most likely they need an alternative access AAC strategy. But most children, 99.9% .9 of children with Angelman that we have encountered in the last 10 years have communicative intent. So PEX is not needed to teach that. Comprehensive AAC is essential. POD is used a lot in, with people with Angelman. Word power on touch chat, proloquo to go. All comprehensive language systems, MinSpeak, Unity, LAMP, Different children are motivated to communicate with symbols for different purposes. So those different purposes need to be modelled and used all throughout that child's life because we just don't know what the hook is going to be that is going to um, motivate them to communicate expressively. We have learned for our children with Angelman syndrome who are not either of them, so back off, lady. Now, if you're saying, do you want this one or this one, my options, if I don't want either of them, are to swat at you or to shut down. Now, if I shut down, you say, oh, you're not ready for choice making. If I push them away, you say, no, don't do that, choose one. Well, lady, I'm only going to choose one if you give, also give me the option of something else. Because if I said to you today, guess what, when we leave here, Oh, we could go bowling or fishing. What do you want to do? Oh, let's ask one at a time. Who wants to go bowling? Nobody. Guess we're going fishing. Oh, maybe none of you are ready for choice making either. <laughs> yeah. And then what you hear is, I don't want to see any behaviours when we get on the bus because you all chose fishing. No, it wasn't an authentic choice. I didn't choose that. I just had two crappy options. And if I was forced to choose, I'd choose the less crappy of them. So we always say, do you want this one, this one, or something else? And when we start this with our adults with Angelman, that something else is magic because all sorts of stuff appears. If there isn't a third option, we say, this one, this one, there's no other options. Because otherwise we might keep asking for all sorts of cakes. It's cheesecake, banana cake, that's all there is. But I need to understand visually that it's this one, this one, oh, nothing else, it's no point asking. But all our students, something else is so powerful because we need our children to understand that their AAC, these symbols, these pictures, these squiggles is power for them. It is not another way for adults to boss them around. We already have so much power. It is our job to start handing some power over to the people with Angelman and to give them that language. We have learned that the communication functions are so powerful for our kids with Angelman. Teaching and requesting is not enough. We've said PEX is not enough. Our students with Angelman, for the most part, can use their body to request, use their gestures to request, use their signs, drag you places. They know how to request. They may be motivated to complain, to comment, to talk about their people. How many people with Angelman have beloved people that they could just stare at and sit with and hug all day, every day? I want to hear about those people. I want you to share the awesomeness that is you. That is why we communicate. So you need a language system that enables you to share that awesomeness, not just request. Because if it's only requesting, that tells everyone that you can only take from this world. And people with Angelman have a hell of a lot to contribute. So their language system needs to reflect that. 
Thank you. We know that aided language input is essential. We know that modelling the system is essential. And we talked about this this morning, but I'm going to show it again because someone might not watch the video. The only reason that you can use this communication system is because you can read the label. So if you lost your voice today and I handed you this communication app, you could use it and you could have a conversation because you can read the label. If you only had some emergent literacy, literacy skills, you might be able to read words like go, but your literacy skills aren't going to help you with that giant word. For most of our children with Angelman, the, their AAC system looks like this. It may as well all be in Greek. So the only way I'm going to learn how that system works is by banging on all the symbols and hearing the voice output by hitting that symbol of a cake and hearing birthday, 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 and having everyone going, yes, there was a birthday six months ago. We've heard about it ever since. <laughs> Every time I point to that symbol in my communication book, someone goes, yes, grandma's birthday. Oh, you're not talking about grandma. Oh, someone at school maybe had a birthday. So we're mapping language onto these squiggles. Even if we can't read the labels, oh, excuse me, I've got something in my mouth. Even if we can't read the labels, we have a really good schema and um, understanding in our brain. So we know that a birthday cake is going to represent something about a birthday. We can see that that box is probably a present. So those squirrels might be present. If we put completely abstract symbols on there, we've got no hope. So our children with Angelman need us to show them what all these squiggles mean. Why, is th why are we bothering with this? Why should I ask all the planets to align? Why should I force my arm to go and touch this? It's because it's power for me. And I can talk about grandpa's birthday. I can babble on with things. I can press a button that sings, um, let it go, 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 all the way in the car and drive everyone batty. That's my way of singing. I can use my voice, I can also use my talker. But this is what we have to map on to the kids. So when someone says, well, he's had this talker for four weeks and he's still not using it, mm, honey, this is what it looks like. It's up to us to start modeling more and more so it starts to make sense. AAC access everywhere is essential. If we do not take the AAC everywhere, if AAC is just at school, AAC becomes work. AAC becomes something I do at school. It's not a way to interact with my family. It's not something wonderful that I can tell granddad I love him. It's just a school thing. So we have the saying, see me, see my AAC. And we might have different AAC for different situations. You might be able to drag it to the pool. You might have a paper-based version, a laminated paper-based version to take to the pool. And there's the lovely Kate Ahern with Samantha, and Samantha's got an um, AAC tattoo on her arm. And if you've got a high-tech system, well, you need to be able to carry it. You need to be able to have it with you all the time. When my child wears her AAC device in public, people treat her with more respect and realise she is smart and worth talking to. When my child wears her AAC device in public, people are more inclined to engage with her and this makes it easier for her to make new friends. I have noticed that he uses his words so much more when he is wearing them. Battery use went from 5 to 10% last school year to 50% this year. Huge increase. Once Mac began using a computer to communicate and having some academic success, he has actually been catapulted by his peers over average status to Stephen Hawking status. We need to remember there's the communications vital triangle. You can have the world's most brilliant, expensive communication system, but if you don't have a rich life of lots of really great stuff to talk about and people to talk to, what's the point? So when we're doing all this intervention with our children, we are also doing intervention to build a really rich life, full of friends, full of people, full of activities, full of animals, whatever their interests are, so they've got lots of things to talk about. 
and lots of people to talk to. The last couple of things we've learned in the last 10 years is that our children and their families require services from speech therapists who are skilled and knowledgeable in AAC. If the speech therapist is not skilled and knowledgeable, then our families and our children require referrals to AAC centres, AAC hubs, where skilled teams can do comprehensive AAC assessments and trials and provide ongoing support for families. So it's okay for speech therapists and professionals not to know, but they, we need them to be referring families to people who do know. We do know that many of our families are disillusioned with speech therapy services and special education services because their child's communication needs are not being met. More training on AAC is required for staff to learn to use and embrace comprehensive AAC. This is what the last 10 years have taught us. Hopefully we'll be standing here in another 10 years and we won't be having these issues. Hopefully in 10 years we'll be sitting here and listening to people with Angelman present for themselves. We've learned that our children with Angelman have enormous potential, that they are multimodal communicators who use every fibre of their being to try and get their message across. We've learned that one day they will present at their own conferences and we've learned that we will all feature in a chapter of their story and we just have to decide what chapter we want to be in. Thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. And we've also got the panel coming up later if you want to get a quick cuppa or the loo break. Um, because Jane and I will be here for the panel. <laughs>